Well, I'm going to read your bio. Okay. And I'm going to sort of start. <laughs> okay. Hello, I'm Amber DiPietra, co-founder of Disability and Sexuality Access Network. And we are taking the time to get to know some of the folks on our directory of disability and sexuality professionals, researchers, workers, artists list. So today we are with Robin Wilson Beatty. Beatty. <laughs> and you can find Robin on our directory, which is at D-A-S-A -A network, DASA network.org on the directory. But her bio, I'll just read for you. She's a, they, Robin, what are your pronouns? She, her. Okay. She is a speaker, writer, and advocate for disability and sexuality, as well as one of the first people to talk about disability, sexuality, and marketing to adult product retailers and manufacturers. She combines years of personal experience with medically sound research to provide a unique perspective on how life and identity impacts one's sexual expression. Her speaking engagements include multiple keynotes and panels, including three consecutive years speaking at the Adult Video Network Convention in Las Vegas. Her work has not only helped tens of thousands of disabled people, but also inspired many others to become advocates for sexuality and disability education, an incredibly underserved area. Robin is a member of the Association of American Sexual Education Counselors uh, and the Women of Color Sexual Health Network, and a graduate and member of the San Francisco Sexuality Information Training program. Currently, she is writing a memoir, which she's going to tell us a little bit more about. And she is a deep fried Southern woman, mid-century buff, and proud mama of one son. Hi. So, Robin, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, it's, it's wonderful to be here. I am glad to get to talk with Dice. Based on and uh, you and all of this. So, good morning. Good morning. Um, so, you are writing a memoir about how you became disabled and a mother, or how would you put it? Okay. Well, um, I what my book is about. I'm talking basically how becoming disabled and a mom. At the same time, um, it basically gave birth to me and gave, you know, and have the journey from, you know, all of a sudden, you know, finding out that I had a ticking time bomb in my spinal cord about to blow and getting pregnant um, right before experimental surgery to save my life. Um, yeah, that whole ordeal and what, how all of that led me to learning about um, how the world doesn't, isn't prepared or doesn't, and also doesn't educate for um, people with disabilities who um, opt to become parents. Mm -hmm. And also about, you know, it, and so anyway, all of that is what led, the book, the book is about, here I'm like, that's a little book, but no, the book is about, yes, that experience, but how it led me to becoming a sex educator. Okay. And so it's that journey and talking about, yeah, how basically when I thought my life was forever changed, I wanted to talk about how that, that entire process is what led me to what I do today. Okay. And I should say you identify as a person with a disability. Oh yeah, multiple disabilities. I have yeah. Oh, let's uh, do visual, audio visual descriptions for folks, which is the right thing to do and I forgot to do. Would you like to describe yourself? Yes, I am, I am Robin Wilson Beatty and I am a, I'm a, a brown skin uh, black woman. I um, have kind of, curly, you know, dark brown hair. I'm wearing a blue 
um, in white checked um, headband and a blue sweater. I have a silver chain on my neck and I am seated in an, uh, on a couch surrounded by chairs and um, a painting by me. Cool, thanks. I'm Amber DiPietra. I am a small stature, uh, Latina, Latinx woman, short brown hair. Um, I'm wearing a black shirt as usual. Uh, I am a wheelchair user, although I'm not sitting in a wheelchair right now, um, though I also still walk to some degree. And I am visually impaired which is re really clear by the fact that my left eye looks totally different than my right eye. Um, so yeah, let's, that's it. Okay, where were we? We were talking about what my book was and I'm like, damn, I need to work on that elevator pitch. Anyway, but hey, I'm getting here. That's why I'm here. I'm writing the book right now and I'm in New York, you know, with my, uh, with friends and, you know, and I'm, I'm writing it and, um, it's, it's more of a process than, you know, I realize. It's not just, oh, wow, I'm just going to get on my keyboard and just talk about shit. No, and it's huge. It's like... It's huge. It takes all this planning and breaking it down and deciding, hey, this is where I started and this is where it ended up, you know, yeah. and, yeah. you know, making that whole and then outlining that whole process, that takes time. And then, you know, and also, but I, I found an amazing book called Fast Draft Your Memoir in 48 Hours, which what they're talking about is how you pace yourself and like, you know, like, this is what you need to do to, it, it, it's amazing. It, actually, the whole, the whole book, the whole process, but I, I was just like, that makes completely and total sense. Yeah. Um, and like, okay, like figuring out where does your book fit in mm -hmm. and, you know, what kind of story is it that you're going to tell? And then, you know, she talks about like the kind of stories. Anyway, I can go on and on about it all day because I'm in the midst of this process. But um, yeah, so I'm actually excited, but it's also, um, it, I'm ready to tell the story. Um, and I have, you know, processed uh, more, some of the traumatic, more traumatic bits of it. And so that way I'm able to write about it because okay. it's hard to write about something if you were still experiencing um, PTSD the, loop. Yeah, P the PTSD from it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, you know, we need so many more disabled stories. So this is, you know, in you figuring out a way to make your story have a form is just more education for these disabled creative writers who want to write their memoir. Um, and you, you know, one of the main things that you say that um, that is known pre-memoir is that you became, like you said, pregnant at the same time that you became disabled and you um, faced a lot of stigma, discrimination from doctors who didn't. Oh, yeah. Yeah who didn't believe disabled women should be parents. No. Um, and didn't, um, called uh, dealing with all of the things. I had a nurse like deal with calling, you know, dealing with the problems that I was having as a result of the disability and, and stuff afterwards, you know, calling it more drama. Oh, wow. Yeah, I'm like, thank you. My disability is drama. Fuck you. Wow, like you're too extra to be having this baby. These additional problems are too extra. Yeah. Uh, well, and I always wondered about that because I have friends, uh, mainly in the San Francisco Bay Area where you um, normally reside when you're not on residency in New York, uh, mm -hmm. who are doulas. And, you know, because there's such a need for advocates for moms in labor. And these are able-bodied women who need these advocates because their agency gets taken away. So. Oh yeah. Yeah. At the time, did you have anything like that? Um, no, my agency was the um, was the 
the privilege and power of a white British man called my husband baby daddy at the time. Um, my kid's father, yeah, my he was my ally and mm -hmm. ally in verb, not just, you know, in name, not mm -hmm. just um, And uh, he, we learned that people would listen to him um, when I could say the same thing and they would ignore it. So he became an advocate, uh, you know, for, you know, the way he became an advocate was all he was there, but he stayed, he made sure he was there every day. Yeah. He came every day. You know, he would, he, he would, his, his company knew that I was undergoing all of that and his boss and, you know, his friends and stuff and yeah. they let him, you know, he would do like remote work, but he was there. He made sure he was there every single day because he saw what would happen when he wasn't like I wasn't getting taken care of like bad things were happening yes um yes. and um like getting dropped you know right after like getting dropped after surgery yeah by a horrible physical therapy person but yeah that's how I, oh, physically that. dropped they oh physically me. dropped <laughs> yeah one two three yeah oh my God. Door. One time had, um, it was a tech and I had this, they gave me this cream that didn't work um, that had capsaicin in it and like that, the pepper um, to help with pain. Oh, okay. And like, um, and so they gave me that cream because I was having extreme pain on my right side and the arm, like it was this burning nerve sensation. Um, and they gave me like, this cream, which didn't do anything. She thought the tech, you know, was cleaning me up. First off, she was cleaning me up with those like antiviral wipes that you're not supposed to use on human skin. But she used that to clean me up, you know, because of course I'm a typical quadriplegic at that point where I cannot move anything much below my um, okay. shoulder. So you had limited access to your own hygiene routine. Yeah. So I had to have care, you know, because I, I couldn't do, I, I was, I was, you know, I was in, I was paralyzed. So um, with the paralysis, you know, you can't do that. So she was um, cleaning me up and then she put, she, I guess she thought it was um, like diaper cream or something, but she sat there and smeared that capsation uh, cream on my vagina and my butt. And so of course, when I was like myself birth. in the morning, it was a fire. And my crutch, literally. And oh my God. Yeah. And so, yeah, see, that's yes, it. That's <laughs> horrific. And you probably already had some open wounds from having just given birth. No, I hadn't given birth at that point. Oh, I you had it. Okay. I was pregnant. Okay. No, I, I mean, oh, this is why I'm, when I talk about this in the book, I'm so glad that I kept journals and things at the time yes because this is back in 2004 so yeah. and it's taken that long for me to actually be able to process and feel like I'm in a position to where I can talk about it um even though it is emotional but I can talk about it somewhat objectively without um you know because I want people to hear it you know, but I also, I don't want to, I don't want them, I, I'm not trying to write trauma for them. <laughs> right, right. And you don't want the emotion to overwhelm the facts of what happened. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But it did in fact happen and you became a disabled mama. And I always wonder if you ever write or speak on uh, disabled life hacks for living with a little child and infant when you're physically disabled. You know, I would, I wish that I got, I had an opportunity to get to do that. I guess I could create it, but um, I just remember, uh, I remember one of the things, like when I was in um, rehab at Shepherd Center, which was awesome, um, I was talking to, um, she was the like peer support coordinator 
And I was talking to her, her name was Mina Hung. And I was talking to, cause I knew she had, she had boys. She had like three kids and mm -hmm. she became injured when her kids were small. And I said, what do you do though, if they're like running away from you and you can't, you know, they're using their legs to run and get into places that you can't go grab them or go get them. And she said, as she goes, like, my boys, when they were, like, trying to run away from she goes, like, and they would, like, climb on the top of their beds. And oh. she said she knew that they had, she said they were going to have to come down eventually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and she'd be there waiting. Mm -hmm. And then until then, and I was like, oh, okay. But um, as far as, like, there were, the tips that I had were, you know, making sure that, um, like, when her, like, when my kid, when his dad would, before he left for the office and things like that, like, making sure I um, had, like, bottles, like, made and, you know, things like that, you know, I had, I had, you know, it took teamwork, but yeah. having, you know, things pre-made, having, um, uh, he would put like filters on all of the taps so that I could access water from mm -hmm. uh, taps anywhere, you know, mm -hmm. rather than, oh, I need to go downstairs and go get. Um, like save yourself know. steps or rolling, yeah. you know. Yes. Yeah. And so we just adapted different things for that. Um, I also, I, we did like co-sleeping um, type thing in there because they have like you can put cold sleepers on the side of the bed on the side of the bed yeah, yeah and you can uh, but or and then there are like a cold sleeping like pad type thing that you can put in the bed you mm -hmm. know like that's you know for the kid but the kid is you know there so in the bed so the kid can be nearby yes and I didn't have because I couldn't be going I, I wasn't going to be able to go walk into another room no, no. Back and forth. And our house was not, um, you know, because we bought this house pre-disability. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so the house was not accessible. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we had to come up with different hacks on, you know, things like that. Yeah. And that was one thing. Co-sleeping, like, is it co-sleeping helped us? I mean, uh, that's great for anyone. Yeah, and it's great for anyone. And I know that, you know, there are... Uh, some, you know, people like to talk about the horror stories about people rolling over on their kids and stuff. Never happened. With no. us. I mean, I, it's for me, but well, also because, you know, like I said, you can have these things like, uh, yes. person, and when the kid got, gets big enough, you know, they move and stuff and, you know, they're crawling, kid was all in my back. And then, you know, a couple of years, I'm like, okay, it's time for you to get in your own bed. Well, but right. That took yeah. a while. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> There's always that transition. Yeah. Um, but I do have to say that that kind of thing um, helped me. Um, and also, but the fact that I had, that I had help in the form of, well, at the time, I didn't think about it as being helpful because I had already undergone so much trauma that just dealing with stuff. But for the first, like, three months of my kid's life, my, uh, my mother-in-law, my, uh, my kid's grandmother had come over from England and stayed with us and took, you know, care of my kid because you know, help, well, I was there too, and I was taking care of the kid, but I was dealing with some very bad postpartum mm -hmm. depression, and, and that, and then I developed postpartum psychosis, mm -hmm. which, you know, all of these are things that I think that these are things that people need to talk about beforehand, because people will talk, we're doing more and more talking about postpartum depression, but we don't talk a lot about postpartum psychosis. The only time you hear about postpartum psychosis is all of a, when you hear of a mom that's killed her kid and herself and, you know, all those right. kinds of things. Right. When it's too late and it's... When it's too late. late. You don't hear about it until it's too late. And it's funny enough was I got diagnosed during a social security disability income review. 
It was hilarious because, you know, they were viewing to see if you still qualify for disability. And this was based on the disability that I was getting for having a mental illness because I had PTSD and trauma um, from past um, trauma and abuse. Um, but I also had, uh, I also had depression and anxiety. Prior and to the, your physical disability. Prior to physical you're becoming disability. So oh I was receiving social security disability income for that. Uh -huh. and, so, and you get a review you know, every five years, I guess, or whatever, yeah. or every few years. And so by the time my kid was born, it was time for that review. Uh -huh. And, but when my, but that was also, like I said, the same year that I got the physical disability. So they didn't know about the spinal cord injury and stuff. And their baby. so when I came in there and I'm just talking, this is, and it happened, like I had my kid in October and that review was in November. Oh, wow. <laughs> that poor psychiatrist. Wow. I just let loose with everything. Yeah. And, and then, yeah, and she's like, okay, I, hey, basically, uh, like, yeah, uh, guess what? You're still disabled. Uh, yeah. Disabled. <laughs> but um, she's like, you have to go get help. You have to. Social me. security person, administrator told you this. Yeah, well, the, that's the, a lovely story because sometimes they're terrible. Yeah, and this is yeah the psychiatrist that they sent you know me to. Oh, the but, psychiatrist you know, that they sent you to. Yeah. Yeah, that you know to do the review, like they have, I guess that they have people that they contract with or whatever. Yeah, so yeah. And I just you know and at that you know I was using a chair, a wheelchair, mm -hmm. and you know rolled up in there and just proceeded to and I and I, I just was just that particular day super dejected you know I was still like you know having I was having of course both physical symptoms of you know that of birth and you know because I was the c-section got infected so I had um I got uh an infection in my pelvis mm -hmm. and so that uh that created a bunch of like complications yeah and things right. and so I just was like you know this was just a lot I dealt yeah. with my you know having my spinal cord cut into you know and my back and stuff and while I was pregnant and so doing rehab while um uh you know mornings it had hypermesis gravidorum which means you throw up the entire time like you're just sick I lost 75 pounds during that oh pregnancy. my goodness so, you know, my body, you know, of course, I had been through an extremely traumatic, you know, thing. You know, it's tr had an extremely traumatic experience dealing with all kinds of unprecedented things that yeah. no one could, you know, you know, could really help me navigate mm -hmm. or have answers for. Yeah. And so... That experience, though, like dealing with all of that and people, you know, not knowing, you know, doctors not quite knowing exactly what was going to happen with my body or knowing what advice or what they felt was correct. And because I was urged to terminate when I, they found out I was pregnant. Right. And so that is when that's when I've learned the importance of being able that I learned the importance of self-advocacy. Mm -hmm. That's when I learned that I have the right to make decisions um, about my health care. Mm -hmm. And I have a right to be involved in making decisions in my health care. And I have a right to be listened to and respected for, you know, my wishes and concerns as well. Because this is my body. This is the one I live with. Yeah. They don't live with this body. I do. Yeah. So, um, and I also had to learn that doctors, you, you know, the medical profession, they'll use the best information that they have at the time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, but also, but it's also a crapshoot, you know? Yeah. It's like based on research and based on what we've seen in other cases. Exactly. They don't, Yeah. You know, this is what we think is going, this is what we predict is going to happen. Yes. So, 
Yeah. So you can't have this baby and us be able to operate on your spinal cord. That's not going to happen. And I'm like, mm, yeah, no, it's going to happen. I'm having this baby. You had this spinal baby. cord surgery while you were pregnant? Mm hmm. Oh my gosh. First trimester. Wow. I was seven weeks along. Wow. I was like six, seven weeks. Yeah. Well, I have so many more questions about that, but I know you have limited time. So I just want to complete the arc. I, I, do you know, I was a resource coordinator in San Francisco for so many years, so my brain just works like that. The yeah. organization support for children and families, I think they are in the Ed Roberts Center in Berkeley. I uh, wish I had had access to something like that. I, yeah. They're amazing. And um, because I would refer to disabled parents to them all the time. Um, so yeah, I'll send you the link later if you want to look them up and connect. But I bet you would, uh, they would want you to be a speaker. Uh, oh, thank you. Because that was, at, you know, like at that time, um, you know, that's what it also taught me about intersectionality and about how other things about your identity impact, you know, how you're listened to who listens to you, and about what options that, um, you know, the medical establishment has for you. Because disability was one a part of it, but, you know, I'm a Black woman, mm -hmm. and this is in the South. Not that, you know, racism, is, of course, we know, is all over this country, but, um, you know, in the South, you know, I'm born, I'm Southern born bred, I can trace my I can trace my lineage all the way back to slavery from like that to when my great 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 grandfather arrived from Africa and like you know and uh, he came over on an illegal slave ship and so I that's why I was able to trace stuff because he came over late in the 18th part anyway but um, so in my family my roots are in Arkansas. So I grew up dealing with some hella racism mm -hmm. um, and things. And so I, I just, it, it, it's, it's bad, but it's like, I just assume that white people are going to be racist, you know, when like against me and, you know, because based on, you know, even though, yeah, um, which people are like, why do you think that all your friends are white? Your husband, you know, I have friends of all races, but I'm, you know, I'm married to a white. I have a Asian partner, you know, I love, I just love. But, um, you know, dealing with that in healthcare when you're, you know, you're trying to um, live, basically, mm -hmm. it's, it, it's kind of, it's demoralizing. Um, and more than demoralizing, it just kind of strips something away from you when basically your humanity is, you know, like kind of dismissed because of your race or your disability or, you know, your, the money you make, you know, class, whatever. The reason, like I said, when I was mentioning using my uh, white British husband as my ally, you know, for my health care is because he was the person that he was male. Yep. He was white. Yep. And British. And let me tell That I, accent I, people respond to. They do, but it's because they're like the colonizers. Yeah. Right? And so it's still that. So white Americans, I swear, they passed down that whole um, colonizer, um, attitude and thinking and beliefs because, you know, that whole Western European, like, you know, supremacy versus like Eastern, Southern European, you know, um, you know, you have, and, you know, in England. So yeah, white British privilege is very, it's something else. And I'm really glad that I, I and my child had that, you know, had access to that. Yeah. Because yeah. that's how we made it. Because also money, that's what I'm saying. He made, he was, he was a software engineer, had good money. So had insurance. Mm -hmm. Thank God. Because mm -hmm. I think, um, because they, this, I, I sit there and think, well, would it have been 
covered. We were very fortunate to be able to have that insurance because then I was able, you know, to go get diagnosed and go get health care and go get all of those things. Um, if I had been in a different situation, say I didn't have health care and stuff, I probably would be dead. I wouldn't be here. Right. Exactly. Yeah, it's so interesting. Um, I mean, I have always wanted to ask you because you are mainly from Atlanta, Georgia, right? Mm -hmm. um, so very Southern. I'm in Florida, but, and now you live in San Francisco Bay Area. I left Florida and lived in San Francisco Bay Area for over 10 years. That's yeah. where I learned to claim my disability identity because to this day, there's not much awareness around disability as an identity and a movement, um, mm -hmm. at least where I'm at right now in Florida. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's like I'm, I grew up in Arkansas because, like okay. I said, that, okay. that we've been there since slavery. And, you know, um, and, you know, my, I mean, we still have this, that family compound basically that my great, great great grandfather like homesteaded during reconstruction wow so you know it's backwoods but you know which is why I, my accent has a bit of a twang because people are like you're southern but it's got something else in there i was like yeah that's arkansas okay. um, but um that was i also have adhd can you tell me what what you were saying amber again i forgot Oh, yeah. Well, I'm just interested in the uh, experience of being someone from the South or from mm -hmm. Arkansas. Like Arkansas South. South. Don't be telling people from Arkansas. Okay. South. Some <laughs> people I've heard say different things, but uh -uh. Yeah. Arkansas. Arkansans will, they will fight. I'm telling you, they were, like, <laughs> they were in the Confederacy. They still, their flag is made up of the Confederate flag. It's uh -huh. just in the shape of a diamond. They took the stars and bars and made it in the shape of a diamond because it's the only state where diamonds have been found. Yeah. Um, okay. I did not know that. Thank you. So, yes, you're very Southern. You went through all of these experiences as a Black disabled woman trying to have a baby in the South. And now you're a writer and speaker and sex educator in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh -huh. and you, you already kind of told us how you survived and your child survived and thrived due to your privilege of being with a white rich man. Uh -huh. But but how what is the South like compared to the San Francisco Bay Area West Coast in terms of disability, race, and sexuality? And I know that's a huge question. Yeah, oh no, 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 no. I love I love the fact getting to answer that. Okay. What I have found, um, now, I came out when I, the first time I had actually, like, I went to the Bay Area was because I went to a conference, an ASEC, um, the uh, conference, the American Association of Educators, Counselors, and Therapists. Um, I went to an ASEC conference um, in Monterey in uh, 2014. Um, and uh, met another, and then and it was with Bethany, and Bethany was like, okay, we're going to go, and we're going to go to Oakland and Berkeley and go do all this stuff. So Bethany that was, Stevens, who is a, uh, activist, educator, researcher, scholar, also living in the South, but also living in the Bay Area. Yes, yeah. Bethany Stevens is amazing, and she, you know, you know how did I survive Atlanta? Bethany um <laughs> but um I mean but seriously Bethany opened my eyes up to so much and she's actually she's gonna be she's part of my book because um yeah. meeting her and becoming friends with her just really changed um a, it she influenced and helped me in ways and learning so much about um, about disability, about disability community, disability networks, disability issues, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, she's amazing. Mm -hmm. I'm so excited because she's going to be a doctor soon. Mm -hmm. but, um, but, uh, what I had to learn 
was, uh, right, no, so, but anyway, the differences that I noticed were when I came over, I was like, wow, okay, A, weed is legal here. And I had you came to the San Francisco Bay Area. From yeah, the San Francisco Bay Area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna go back to 2014 now. Yeah, and then going out there, and you know, uh, we did a photo shoot, and with and Jim Lebrecht was there, who you know, Crip Camp. Oh, Crip Camp. Yes. Yeah, and he was taking pictures and stuff. We were at the studio where he worked. <laughs> so, you were just having a personal photo shoot for fun. Uh huh. We did it with, well, it was a whole bunch of people with disabilities and we were like oh. doing like this nude body project and it was like all kinds of different bodies. And I have, I don't know whatever happened with that, but I still have some pictures. Wow. Yeah. I don't know how I missed that because I left in 2014 and I just have so much. That's not even FOMO. It's like, anyway. But she, I remember because she did that like cool thing. And so we did that. And uh, then um, going off to, you know, just, just experiencing the Bay Area. But then, you know, I'd already read and knew about like Berkeley and, and Robert Center and stuff and just being able, just being able to be there. But also I found that um, there were oh, also, okay, dating. No, okay, let me, I'm just gonna be real. Okay, so then I noticed that it was a lot easier for me to date in San Francisco than yes. it was in Atlanta. Yes. Um, because A, if you're talking about uh, ratios, when you're talking about single men, single women, and ratios, there are way more single women than single men in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. So the numbers were not in my favor. Mm -hmm. And I'm black. Mm -hmm. I have a disability. You know, all of those things. I noticed that, so like, I had also, I had made friends, you know, who lived in the Bay Area because I went to this thing um, from ASECT. I went, uh, I, I met another sex educator who was running a uh, business, sex educator business camp called Sex Geek Summer Camp. And his oh, name is yes. Reed, uh -huh. Reed Mahalko. And so I went to... I'd go because um, I'm polyamorous and um, he was, you know, we were, he was a partner. And so I would go out to visit him. But, you know, I'd also, I opened up Tinder, Tinder in 2015. Ooh, in the Bay Area. Way too much fun. Yeah, yeah. I also <laughs> missed the, I was in the OK Cupid get on your browser age. I was, oh, I was like tenderonies, just <laughs> just out here, and I would I have that some days I would be lining up two dates that day. Like I'd have a lunch date, and this one dude because I was like, "You're too young, but you can bring me food," and like he brought me a burrito, <laughs> and then I was like, "Thank you," and then the next, then a few hours later, I went on on a date, and went to the theater, um, it with someone else, and I was going, but that was the thing, um, I was. It, it was, it was very, it was different because I was able to date people. I was able to, I was, it, it, because of the ratio, like I said, there are a lot more single men in the San Francisco Bay Area, particularly San Francisco, um, than there were women because tech industry, tech industry is heavily male. Yes. And so you have all of these guys that are living there and they're like, wow, uh, that, you know, you have men that are heterosexual or, you know, bisexual mm -hmm. or whatever, but they're attracted to women and they want to date. And uh, that, so it, I had a good time. Mm -hmm. And um, I was like, yeah, but more than that, I also, I like what I felt the main thing was about moving to what the difference was it, uh, ideas in California, being able to have ideas is a step, it's actually, it's encouraged. Yeah. Having ideas, dreams, visions, goals, working towards those things, that was that was more celebrated and accepted and sponsored versus in Atlanta, I kept hearing all of the time when I said, I want to do sex education, disability and sexuality. I want to, I kept hearing, 
nobody's going to hear that. Nobody wants to listen to that. Yes. You're not going to make, you're not going to make any money or what, what are you going to do with that? Okay. You know, and I was told, I kept, I was told so much in Atlanta that I was not going to be able to talk. I wasn't going to be able to talk about sexuality. And, stuff. Mm -hmm. and that was the other thing because I got so much pushback from the, you know, the professional developmental disability field, mm -hmm. um, you know, in all the different types of offices that you have there, like the Center for Independent Living or the, you know, councils or this or yeah. they were like, you can't talk about sex. Mm -hmm. And this- And this was what year? 2000, 2010, 2011, 2012. Not very long 13, ago. 13, and yeah. And because I was getting in trouble because, you know, I was, you know, I was professionally employed um, in developmental disability world and I was working in youth advocacy. And, but in the South, that's the thing. The South is different because other places in the United States were, you know, because I was, I was looking at Chicago and like the empowered Fifi's and, you know, all of this. And I was like, why can't we do this here with our youth? Yes. What? And because I'm like, they're not getting sick, but you know, the South is also, you know, a lot of abstinence only sex education. Yeah, there's a more conservative Christian right. Yeah. Close. That so, is not always hospitable to people of color with disabilities who want to talk about sex. No, it's not. And, um, but my youth were like, you know, they were, they told me, they were like, yeah, Ms. Robin, um, you know, because Southern, um, you know, you know, employment is important. I know it's important to get a job and I know it's important to, you know, be able to have the transportation system to where we can get it and advocate for that kind of thing. But I want to know, um, how do I ask somebody out on a date? Yes. When is it okay to kiss somebody? Yes. And then, you know, other more complicated questions. And, um, I... And so I was like, and I remember going to my boss with this and saying, you know, because I was like, oh, well, we're supposed to have youth-led programs, and this is what this grant is for. Like, the youth are supposed to decide, you know, the things that they want to advocate and what they want to do. And she was like, oh, no, we can't talk about that. Right. We can't right. talk about the sex. No. Yeah. And I went, but this is what they want to do. And, of course, you know, because sex is... I and mean, so then, I mean, when you put it like that, it was like, it was this whole attitude of this is wrong or you have to shush it up. Or, I don't know what they acted like. I was going to be sitting there throwing orgies in the office, but, you know, I'm like, right. Right. I, I'm like okay. And I'm kind of, I can be kind of obstinate when, you know, when I'm like, this doesn't make Mm -hmm. sense mm -hmm. and that um why are we being so shameful about something that is you know important and uh, you know and affects your life sexuality is a natural part of who we are as humans it's an instinctual part of who we are it's and one of the biggest things that makes us human thank you yeah exactly so I'm like, and we, you know, you, you can't pretend that, it, and also, but so for me, that was like, we're infantilizing. And when I say youth, I am talking 17 through 28. We ain't talking yeah. babies. Right, right. So um, I left that organization and went to another one and that I recently wrote about uh, that in a, accommodations and stuff and disability, I wrote a chapter that's getting published talking about my experience and what happened when about not getting disability accommodations at a disability organization. Yes. Uh, yeah. And uh, because people think, oh, well, if you're a disability organization, then of course they get it. They get all of this. No, they don't. Mm -hmm. they don't because also a lot of times, because, and this was the problem, people without disabilities are the people in charge of running these programs. Or the funders who say, I wanna work on this thing and that's what I'm giving you money for. And I don't care about sex education or any of that, so they gotta do what the funders want. 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I, that was, that was when um, I start, you know, then, you know, we're kind of 2013 and I volunteered at a conference and I got to meet one of, because I'd already been working grassroots doing disability and sexuality education and talking about my experience, going to med school, you know, just doing it all just on my own, in my off time. That was the other thing that was, my boss was all upset. Cause like, basically, cause I was going around, I was like, this has nothing to do with our office. Right, you were this doing that amazing. as an independent, yeah. yeah. Because, you know, as activism, that's because this is what I believe. And because I, you know, saw that people needed to share the, and talk about these things. Mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, the importance of like body safe toys. I, nobody taught, you know, if I, I wish in rehab, they had talked to me about sex toys, body about, sex you know, toys. things that, so, you know, all of those things. And so I, you know, when I came to the Bay area, I was like, I found out that, yeah, not only could I talk about those things, I could be encouraged and I could learn and I could grow. So that's why I moved out here. I mean, I was broke as fuck. I had no money, like none. Got just got divorced from that white British husband, so no money, nothing. Um, had filed bankruptcy. I the only thing I owned was my car, and so I like gave most of my stuff away, put stuff in storage. It broke my heart, but my kid um, was, you know, had was the dad and his new wife, um, you know, the kid was there and, you know, was with them. So I packed up my car and I had a friend and we drove cross country from Atlanta to San Francisco, where fortunately, because I had been coming out to the Bay Area and things, you know, visiting beforehand, um, you know, I'd made friends, and so uh, I had a friend, um, Alex Morgan, who is a sex mm -hmm. educator, yeah, mm -hmm. and so Alex had um, needed a roommate, so I stayed, I, you know, I, I moved in with Alex, I did the San Francisco sexuality information training, um, they gave me a scholarship, because like I said, had absolutely no money, um, was, you know, thank God for California having, that was the other thing, getting services was way easier. I did not, Disability I did, services. it's very different than it is in Georgia. Like I was able to sign up for uh, CalABLE, uh, which, you know, was the, the EBT program to get food. I was able to do that online. No problem. No having to go to an office and waiting in line and turning in forms. Just fill it out online. Then I also was able to get health care. Medi-Cal. I just Medi signed up. Bam. California's oh. version of Medicaid, which is probably the most expansive in the country. Whereas Georgia, oh God, no. I mean, it's, it's, it's just very, very different. I didn't realize that it could be that different until I, you know, moved to California. Because states have the option to pick and choose what parts of Medicaid they want based on how much money they're willing to put into it. So more conservative states have very limited Medicaid services. Yes. Yeah. And it makes it very hard. So I've been on many boards, like parental boards um, for uh, students with disabilities because my, my child um, is um, on the autism spectrum. And so I'm on those boards and people are like, we're, you know, my husband got a job and we're moving to Georgia and I wanted to know about service from, but they're like, where are you? And people are talking like Massachusetts or they're like, you need to stay there. <laughs> they were like, because your kid is not going to get any of those services. Do not, do not move. Yes. Yeah. And that's a whole nother conversation. Yeah. What do we say for people like myself who are disabled and living in the South? I mean, yeah, that's a, and I, that's, I want to tell you it's, 1230. Oh, yeah, I got to get going. But okay. I do want to say that. Um, but you know, I'm not saying like, it's all dire, and you have to go move to another state in order to get those services. But that's also why, you know, you advocate and also but I, I like the fact that I have had that experience, because 
you know, even though I have these things in California that is like, hey, guess what? They, people don't have there. Or guess what? This is what people are dealing with here. This is, and like, and as I tell people all the time, I said, the rest of the United, there's, the rest of the United States, it's not California. So they can be yeah. very oblivious. Very, very. I said, this is privilege. A I was like, this is a privileged bubble. And I said, and, and yes, I moved to this bubble because I, I want to take advantage of some of this privilege. But, you know, I also, but that's the thing. You have to be able to help everyone and you have to be able to fight for everyone to be able to have access to these kinds of things that they need and to support, you know, other people with disabilities everywhere who are, you know, who are having their rights, you know, trampled and stuff on. So, um, I know, I, I hope I have given you some of the things. <laughs> you have given me, I could talk to you for hours and hours, so I hope we do that again soon, but it has been so fun talking to you. So if people want to contact you from the Dasan directory, would they contact you um, as like a consultant? Uh, co I, okay, so this is what I do. I am, uh, as you hear, I have a mouth. I, I like to research. I like to research and talk about things. So, um, and I like to, any subject that people want to hire me to talk about related to sexuality or um, write, I love writing. Writing is my thing. I like to write articles and things that, and you can find them on everything from like AARP or, <laughs> um, or Googleable. Yeah, very Google. Yeah, just you can, but my website is um, robinwb.com. So pretty simple. Um, and you can find me on Twitter at, at, at sexabled. <laughs> um, that's where you, you can get in touch with me. Um, but that is that is what I do is I, I speak. And I write and, you know, I can consult as well. I can talk about making things accessible um, as far as, and especially like sexuality, how to, um, you know, how to do basically, you know, I, I've also, you know, worked on doing trainings about yeah. different things. So, um, yeah, I do a lot. Hey, great. If well, you want to pay me money, hey, yeah, I'll do it. <laughs> Thank you so much for doing this. And we're so thrilled that you're on our Dasan directory and part of our collective. Well, I'm thrilled to be part of it. And I'm really excited and I'm glad that, I'm also really excited that, you know, a network like this exists. So. Thanks. Thanks. Okay.